Attention, attention please. May I have your attention? Please stay seated as this year's graduates enter the hall. Hello. I am pleased to welcome Michelle Pedersen to the podium to sing the national anthem. Michelle Marie Pedersen has been a soprano for the University of Utah's graduate vocal quartet for the past three years. Ms. Pedersen has enjoyed a career outside of the school singing professionally with the Ohio Light Opera, Utah Opera, and performing with various symphony orchestras in the Salt Lake area. She is proud to be part of the U of U graduating class of 2023, receiving her DMA in vocal performance. Oh, 
say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Okay, because nothing's official these days unless it's on Facebook. Say cheese. Boshu <laughs> Nishinaabe, welcome friends. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner and I have the privilege of being the Dean at the SJ Quinney College of Law. My pronouns are she and hers. And as we do whenever we gather in large groups, I want to start with the University of Utah Tribal Land Acknowledgement Statement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is a traditional and ancestral homeland for the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. We are so very pleased to be joined on stage today by what constitutes an incredible faculty. Members of the faculty, would you please stand and be recognized? You may be seated. I would also like to present what our students know is the secret ingredient at the SJ Quinney College of Law, and that is our staff. The magic that happens during the academic year is simply not possible without our amazing staff. And so I ask these individuals in the audience to please stand, wave, and be recognized. Thank you. In addition to our wonderful faculty and staff, I would also like to welcome some special guests who are, we are honored to have here today. First, our convocation keynote speaker, Justice Jill Pullman, who is a Justice of the Utah Supreme Court and an SJ Quinney College of Law alum. <laughs> Sitting to her left is University of Utah trustee Katie Eccles. And sitting to her left is University of Utah trustee Basam Salem. Before this ceremony began, we showed pictures of our graduating students, both as children and now as graduates of the SJ Quinney College of Law. It truly is remarkable to see just how far you've come. Let's reflect on just a few, shall we? Aww. Now, who's that? Let's see. Aww, it's Anna Passman. 
Allen our, from our JD class. Oh, I love it. Let's see what we have next. Aww. So cute. Now, who could that be? Oh, it's Drake Males from our MLS class. Okay, so let's see. Who do we have next? Oh, well, that kind of looks a little familiar. Huh. I wonder who that is. Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, okay. That is an unflattering picture, but... If you ever were concerned, you know you can't smile after law school. It's possible. Uh, let's take that. Okay, good. That picture's down. All right. When we first met in August 2020, who would have guessed everything you would overcome? I was so excited to see what you would accomplish. I bet you were too. You may not recall, but back then, Dean Reyes Aguilar gave your class a word, a word that he thought represented you, and that word was pivotal. The definition of pivotal is of crucial importance in relation to the development or success of something else. Today is the birthday of our namesake, S.J. Quinney, who proved pivotal to our community. S.J., otherwise known as Joe Quinney, was a talented lawyer, prominent businessman, and ski industry pioneer. He was a founding partner in the distinguished Salt Lake City law firm of Ray Quinney Nebaker where he practiced until his death at age 90. A pioneer in establishing Utah's ski industry by founding Alta Ski Area, Quinney was a prime force in the development of Utah's legal and business communities. His enthusiastic, lifelong interest in and support for art and culture broadened the force of his statewide impact. Like S.J. Quinney, you have truly been pivotal in so many ways pivotal to our College of Law community, and pivotal to our larger community. You have made the world a better place and accomplished amazing things despite the tremendous obstacles you have faced. You are truly outstanding. Let's reflect on just some of the things you have accomplished these past few years. First, you survived, and you are here to graduate. That in of itself is a major accomplishment. It's a major accomplishment in normal years and particularly impressive given you were all impacted by COVID-19 and you started during COVID-19. Truly impressive. You proved pivotal in meeting legal needs of the community regardless of one's capacity to pay. The class of 2023 completed over 1,500 volunteer pro bono hours serving clients' needs as part of the college's pro bono initiative. Yes. <laughs> Maxwell Milovets truly outdid himself logging over 400 pro bono hours during his time at the law school. Many of you proved pivotal in making our S.J. Quinney College of Law better. Your student bar association, led by Jessica Arthurs, <laughs> did a fantastic job of bringing back many traditions following years of silence because of COVID-19, such as your Barrister's Ball at the Natural History Museum, which was a huge success. I want to acknowledge those in addition to President Arthurs, who also served on the Student Bar Association during their time at the College of Law. They included Hannah Pickett, Meg Glassman, Shelby Stender, Kaylin Etman, Brooke Porter Coles, Michelle James, Isaiah Odenkrantz, and Nicole Johnston. Like our Student Bar Association, the Utah Law Review staff proved pivotal in advancing the discussion of the future of antitrust law by hosting a symposium exploring the progressive agenda for antitrust and consumer protection law. And several of you proved pivotal in starting new civil uh, student groups at the College of Law, such as Hannah Sukala, Zara Guignard, and Victoria Carrington and Nicole Johnston, who started new groups.
You also made your mark on competition teams, such as the trial advocacy team, which included Charles Campbell, Charles Rasmussen Goodwin, Shelby Stender, and Hannah Sukala, which competed at both the All-Star National Challenge and the Texas Young Warriors National Trial Competition. And Shelby Stander received the Outstanding Advocate Award at the National All-Star Competition. <laughs> Cal and Allen and Nicholas Simons both proved pivotal to their teams when they competed at the National Moot Court Regional Competition held in Missoula, Montana this year. Lauren Hawks, Rachel Heathcote, and Jensen Lilquist did a fantastic job of representing the SJ Quinney College of Law at the Pace Environmental Law Moot Court competition. Samuel Flitton and Hannah Pickett mastered international law at the Pacific Regional Competition of the Jessup International Law Court competition. And the hard work put on by the team of Jordan Kobabe, Victoria Carrington, and Spencer Fenimore proved pivotal to their success at the National Patent Application Drafting Competition as they placed third overall in the regional competition. <laughs> Similarly, Devin Geyer and Ashton Ruff's hard work paid off as they advanced to the quarterfinal round of the Giles Sutherland Rich Memorial IP Moot Court Competition. And Shelly Potter finished her time at the College of Law by winning the Best Overall Oralist Award at the Annual Trainer Moot Court Competition. <laughs> Our MLS students have proved equally pivotal, making both the world and college a better place. They served in a wide range of jobs while working on their MLS degrees such as a wildlife lands coordinator, to construction project manager, to chief, yes, to chief operations officer, to an eighth grade teacher, to a highway patrol trooper, to the vice president of people and culture. And they are using their knowledge of the law to make a wide range of fields better. Many are first generation students leading the way for generations to come. And there is a wide age range among the group, as the youngest is 23rd, 23, excuse me, and the senior, most senior in the group, is 66. They also speak a wealth of languages, such as Tongan, Spanish, and Portuguese. And Ashley Caldwell proved pivotal to winning a gold, an Olympic gold medal, that is, as she was part of the first mixed aerial team to win gold at, the, at last year's Winter Olympics. And the class of 2023 was not one to rest on just that. Several members of the class decided that they wanted to publish legal articles, proving pivotal in providing research and advocacy that could change the law for the better. Mary Grace Thurman placed her article, Making Money Green, with the William & Mary Environmental Law and Policy Review. Karina Wells co-authored Plastics and the Limits of U.S. Environmental Law, which will be published very soon in the Harvard Environmental Law Review. When not working as editor-in-chief for the Utah Law Review, Jensen Lindquist co-authored two articles with faculty members, one published in the California Law Review titled Laboratories of the Future, Tribes and Rights of Nature, and the other to be published by the Minnesota Law Review titled Fixing Disparate Prosecution. And he was the sole author of Comedy, Federalism, and the Law of Interstate Abortions. Victoria Carrington, yeah. Victoria Carrington co-authored an article titled Nature Biotechnology. Vince Mancini's note in the Utah Law Review was titled The Court's Gerrymandering Conundrum, How Hyperpartisanship in Politics Alters the Rousseau Decision. <laughs> <laughs> and Dylan Raymond's note titled 25 is the New 18, Extending Juvenile Jurisdiction and Closing Its Exceptions will be published shortly. Alex Chang was the lead author on an article that was published in the Utah Bar Journal titled Resolving the Doll Conundrum, which stems in part from Alex's directed research project focusing on Utah's Asset Protection Trust statute. And you did so much more. Yes, you did so much more! 
Samantha Meeker spoke about, spoke about her path to law school at the Federal Bar Association's 10th Circuit Rising Professional Symposium, joining co-panelist Utah Supreme Court Justice Paige Peterson and entertainment attorney Jeff Cohn, who you may know as the former child actor who played the character Chunk in the movie The Goonies. Zara Ginnard was awarded the grant from the Golden Rule Project for her innovative research on sexual harassment in the workplace. At, as a Quinney Research Fellow, Victoria Carrington worked closely with Professor George Contreras on a research project focused on intellectual property landscapes surrounding a new assisted reproductive technology. Paris Wagner. Paris Wagner received the Wallace Stegner Center's Robert Schmid Natural Resources Writing Award, which is given annually to the student who authors the best paper on a natural resources topic. In her leadership role, yes. In her leadership role in the Women's Law Caucus, Brooke Porter Coles was instrumental in launching a mentorship program that matches female SJ Quinney students with local female attorneys to provide career guidance, support, and friendship. Jacob Bandus was awarded the Wallace Stegner Center's Dewsnap Fellowship, earning him a clerkship with the Chief of Natural Resources Division in the Attorney General's Office for the summer of 2021. <laughs> Jordan Kobabe worked with IP faculty to provide patent filing advice to 17 interdisciplinary student teams from across the state as part of the university's Bench to Bedside competition hosted by University of Utah Health Center for Medical Innovation. And Meg Glassman traveled to New York City to present her research at a conference at Columbia University, and she also presented at a national genetics meeting. And last, you were pivotal in starting new traditions that I think are gonna be your legacy and long last your time here, as you started a tradition of awarding uh, awards to class members. And these were awards voted on by your own class. Nikki Crabtree received the Outstanding Colleague Award. <laughs> Jessica Arthurs received the Outstanding Student Leader Award. Abigail Phillips was named the Outstanding Social Justice Champion. And the first and second year students voted Ellie Bradley, winner of the Outstanding Mentor Award. Now this doesn't even begin to capture all of the great work that you, the class of 2023, have already done. But it does give us a glimpse into the great things that you will accomplish. The world is simply a better place with you in it. As Faith Hill sang, it's that pivotal moment, it's ah, uh, impossible. <laughs> but for the class of 2023, it is not impossible, as you have proved pivotal to accomplishing so much during your time at the SJ Quinney College of Law. I can't wait to see all you're going to do as alumni. And always, always remember, we love you. And next, we will hear from our student speakers. First is Brooke DeWise, the class of 2023 MLS student speaker. She will be followed by Madeline Nancy Rooker, the class of 2023 JD student speaker. And our final student speaker is president of the Student Bar Association, Jessica Lee Arthurs. Good afternoon, or good morning, I should say. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank loved ones, professors, faculty, and fellow graduates for being here today. It is an honor and a privilege to speak to you and celebrate this magnificent milestone. Given that we are here at law school commencement, it is only appropriate that we pull from the wisdom of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. One day, when upon boarding a train, he could not locate his ticket. 
The conductor recognized him and noticed he couldn't locate it, so he said to the justice, Your Honor, I know you are an honest man, and I know you would not purposely hide your ticket, so when you reach your destination, simply mail it to the railroad station, and everything will be fine. The justice looked up to the conductor with a little hesitation in his eyes, and he said, The question is not where is my ticket, but where am I going? My name is Brooke King DeWise, and many, 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 many years ago, 25 to be exact, I graduated from the University of Utah David Eccles School of Business. I pressed on and I obtained my CPA, and unlike Justice Holmes, I knew exactly where I was going. I wanted to live in New York City, work on Wall Street, and never, ever have children. <laughs> Truth, I am now 49 years old, I have nine children. <laughs> That's right, nine more than I said I would have. And all I want to do is spend time on the farm in Delta, Utah, population 3,000. <laughs> I grew up in the insurance industry, and, um, and it monopolized our lives so much that I swore I would never be in insurance. Hence, I went to school in accounting, the most stable and steady career I could find that was not insurance. Truth, for the last 26 years, I've worked in insurance. I never imagined or planned on returning to school, so how did I find myself in the MLS program? Currently, I serve as the Chief Operating Officer of the largest privately held insurance broker in the Northwest. I conduct monthly employee meetings, and I conclude with an inspirational quote and theme for the month. One month, I wanted to emphasize learning, and I came across a quote by Albert Einstein, who once said, when you stop learning, you start dying. That hit me profoundly. Truth, I'm approaching my 50s, and my aging, has been at the forefront of my mind. Merge my, my aging and Einstein's quote, and well, you get the brilliant idea to uh, embark upon a Master of Legal Studies degree. Since then, I can't tell you how many times that I've made a substantial and costly error in judgment. <laughs> Truth, I have received from the University of Utah Law School an education that has given me a newfound desire to live and see the world in a new way. So what have I learned? I learned about this cute little book it's blue, and we're having a blue book bonfire following the ceremony. <clears throat> I will never be able to look at a banana peel again without analyzing the shade of brown to determine negligence or gross negligence. I will never be able to look at an Instagram post without considering the legalities such as, does that post my friend just made constitute a contract, and is there an offer acceptance and consideration? I once was engaging and inviting in conversation, and now, well, I'm obnoxious and interrogating and asking, now do you have documentation on that? <laughs> the most fascinating learning experience was attending a mediation with Professor Clark, which was like standing in the middle of an MMA ring watching a kick to someone's head, and she catches it midair. <laughs> in business IP law, we learned about killer Korean bots as well as, well, other bots. While, on the on, while the online cohort suffered through Super Study Sundays to get all their assignments in by midnight on Sunday, the 2023 in-person cohort will go down in history as the foodie cohort. <laughs> Most importantly, I learned that Professor Giora loves adjectives. <laughs> while there is some truth to the above learnings, that which we learned in law school is best described by Justice Holmes when he said, a man's mind stretched by new ideas may never return to its original dimensions. We can concur that with this as our learnings from law school have taught us to think in new ways, ideas have transformed our minds, and our thought process is different. We can now see both sides to a story, all aspects of an issue, and talk about them intelligently and respectfully, and we can think critically about exceptionally challenging matters. Truth, three things in life are certain, death, taxes, and change. One of my favorite academics was Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, known for disruptive innovation. In his work, he shared the idea of deliberate strategy and emergent strategy. This idea is analogous to my life. While I had the most deliberate plans and I knew where I was going, emergent strategies took hold. It is how you react to these that define you. Embrace those emergent strategies as they may not take you on the path that you anticipated, but if you are open, you can pivot and create opportunities that far surpass all ex expectations of your deliberate plans. This moment right here today is the most pivotal moments of your life. Law school has been one big gigantic test and now the life lessons begin. I'm going to leave you with some final truths. Truth, learning is living, never stop learning. Truth, live to work, don't work, don't, 
work to live, <laughs> don't live to work. I wish I had applied that earlier in my career. Truth, never say never, because you never know where you're going to end up. Truth, change is opportunity. If you lead with change, you prosper. It's been a pleasure to share this journey with all of you, and I must express my profound gratitude to the professors, students, the university, and our loved ones. We will forever be grateful to our professors and to each other for enabling the transformation of our minds and instilling us with grit. As we go about our lives, periodically take a moment and ask, as Justice Holmes did, where am I going? And evaluate whether it is serving you, your family, and those around you for the better. Congratulations, graduates, and I wish you all the best. Good morning, everybody. I am Maddie Rooker, and I'm a member of the graduating JD class today. Not long after we started at SJQ, the people around us who had already made it through law school started telling us about all of the things that didn't matter. Don't worry about your grades. They don't matter. Don't worry about your score on the bar exam. It doesn't matter as long as you pass. Don't worry about what classes you take. Just focus on practical experience. At the time, I think my response to those statements was something like, well, it's easy for you to say that my grades don't matter, but you don't have to take Professor Peterson's contracts final next week, <laughs> or Dean Heine's evidence exam, or turn your transcripts into employers soon. But now that I've made it to this point where the grades are in and the classes are over, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what parts of law school really mattered especially if those people were right before about what didn't. Without a doubt, our legal education mattered. We received a top-tier education at SJQ. Our professors taught us how to think like lawyers, how to be independent thinkers and zealous advocates, and perhaps most importantly, that the only correct answer to any legal question is, it depends. <laughs> The education we received at S.J. Quinney prepared us to practice the law, and for that, I want to thank the faculty, staff, and administrators here today. But there's something else, too. I believe that our class is unique among many other law school classes. We began our first year of law school in the middle of a deadly pandemic wearing masks, sitting six feet apart, forced to figure out law school by ourselves. No fall break, no way to walk into professor's offices or run into two L's and three L's in the hall to ask for advice. But we found a way to get to know each other. We hiked, we played a lot of ping pong. Some of us even played pickleball every week as a way to get to know each other, relieve stress, and to avoid our legal research homework. One more game, anybody? We even started group me chats where every Friday, classmates would send inspirational messages and memes to each other. As time went on, we came back to the law building. Things changed, but our relationships only grew. We supported each other through the deep black hole that is 2L year of law school. We shared outlines, flow charts, football tickets, therapist recommendations, study rooms, and physical space. We found a way to avoid much of the interclass competition that can easily come between students who go out for the same jobs or contend for the highest grades in their classes. And suddenly we were three L's, too burned out to care, but too type A to actually stop trying. <laughs> Working, taking classes, completing fellowships, getting married, having children. But despite how ready we were to be done, the most common statement I heard from my classmates when I remarked on how quickly graduation was approaching was how much they were going to miss seeing everybody and being in the building together. So if you ask me today, as a new law school graduate, what matters about law school, I would agree with those people from before. Most of the things that feel like they will make or break your career when you're a 1L don't really matter, but the relationships you make do. The connections we built, the hardships we shared, the fact that it feels so hard to say goodbye, especially to those of you who will be leaving Utah, those are the things that matter. Years from now, I don't think I'll remember most of the grades I got or the classes I took in law school, 
but I will remember the late night ping pong during finals, the pickleball, the football games, the time spent together on the fifth floor talking about our futures, bar reviews, barrister's ball, long aimless walks around the city, and of course, lively debates about the owl theory in evidence class. My classmates told me they would remember student org events, vacations with law school friends consoling each other after a bad exam score being rejected from a job, and learning together that academic success isn't tied to personal worth. After three years, it is the relationships and the friends that stand out in our memories. Like you heard earlier, as he does with every class, Dean Aguilar chose a word to describe the class of 2023, pivotal. I like that word for us, but I also don't think you can describe the class of 2023 in one word. So if I may, in closing, let me suggest a few others. We, the SJ Quinney class of 2023, are advocates, bold, a community, compassionate, dependable, indomitable, and resilient. To end, I want to say thank you to my family who has given me more support in every stage of my life than I can ever explain, to my professors who gave me the skills and the knowledge I need to succeed in a fulfilling legal career, to the administration and staff who are tireless advocates of SJQ students, but most of all, to each of you, my hopefully lifelong friends. These relationships are what make the SJQ class of 2023 unique. It was never just about the grades for us. Our law school experience was in so many ways about each other. Good luck to each of you in the next chapters of your lives. It has been a true privilege to spend the last three years with you, and I cannot wait to see where we all go from here. Congratulations, SJ Quinney class of 2023, and for one final time as a student, go Utes. Hello, my name is Jessica Arthurs, and it is a tremendous honor to address you all as the Class of 2023's Student Bar Association President. I would like to begin by thanking our hardworking events team, marketing, IT, and all of the building staff who have made today and so many other memorable events possible. And I'd like to acknowledge the faculty and professors with us who have challenged us and enabled our great achievement here today. And on behalf of all of us, it is a special honor to thank our friends and family here and on Zoom who have been with us on each step of this journey. I know I certainly haven't made it easy. I thought I would start by posing one last hypothetical. Take notes, I'm reserving the right to cold call. What happens when you put, say, 100 total strangers on a Zoom call, teach them the fundamentals of a legal education all in the midst of natural disasters, unprecedented political events, and the release of two new Taylor Swift albums? <laughs> Any gunners? No? Well, good thing I came prepared this time. The correct answer is the class of 2023's 1L year, but I know from personal experience that this not-so-hypothetical environment has produced 87 resilient, creative, innovative, and boundary-pushing lawyers. As incoming students, none of us knew what to expect upon entering law school, but each of us was determined, regardless of circumstance, to see it through. And over these years, we have forged relationships, celebrated our wins, and supported each other through our difficult times in backyards, six feet apart, on the ski slopes, in bars, at work, and today, here together. The famous University of Utah alum and Pulitzer Prize winner Wallace Stegner, while remarking on the profound impact the West had on him, he once said, I have not escaped it. It has to have shaped me. These three years have shaped me. Every single one of you has shaped me. I'm not the person who walked into orientation three years ago full of uncertainty. Rather, today, I am confident 
standing here in the class of 2023's ability to make broad and positive changes to the legal profession. We have challenged the status quo of what it means to be a law student, and we will continue to challenge the status quo of what it means to be attorneys. And really, what parting words do I have for such a formidable group? Well, as we embark on our next steps, I want to leave you with a quote from one of my favorite books by John Steinbeck. Now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. <laughs> our education has demanded the absolute best from us, but as we turn our attention towards our future pursuits, I encourage you to take with you what makes us good. Continue to carve out time to celebrate, collaborate, tend to and grow the networks of support we formed here and as, as across the United States as we move. And I urge you to bring goodness into the places you work. Demand equity, seek out justice, lift others up with you, and make intentional choices in your practice to build a better Salt Lake, a better Utah, and a better world. Thank you for the privilege of representing you this year. And congratulations to the class of 2023. We did it. And now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Justice Jill Pullman, who is both a Justice of the Utah Supreme Court and an alum of the S.J. Quinney College of Law. Justice Jill Pullman was appointed to the Utah Supreme Court in June 2022 by Governor Spencer Cox. At the time, she was serving as associate presiding judge on the Utah Court of Appeals. Judge Pullman gradu graduated magna cum laude from the University of Utah in 1993 and received her Juris Doctorate from the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah in 1996, where she served on the Utah Law Review and graduated Order of the Coif. After law school, she clerked for the Honorable Dave K. Winder of the United States District Court for the District of Utah. And prior to her appointment to the bench, Justice Pullman was a partner at the law firm at Stoll Reeves in Salt Lake City. She practiced there for 19 years, during which she maintained a complex civil litigation practice, including administrative, trial, and appellate work. Justice Pullman currently sits on the Judicial Council's Committee on Judicial Outreach and has previously served on several committees, including the Utah Supreme Court's Advisory Committee on the Rules of Appellate Procedure, the Utah Supreme Court's Ethics and Discipline Committee, and the Utah Supreme Court's Division Committee. Please welcome Justice Pullman. Thank you, Dean Kronk Warner. Before I jump into my remarks, I want to thank the student speakers. You were fantastic. I was so inspired by your words, both by what you said about your future and your experience here at the law school, but also about the way you talked about your fellow students. You're truly lucky to have this camaraderie among you, and you should cherish it and continue to, to foster it as your years go on. I want to thank you, the class of 2023, for letting me be here with you today. It is such an honor to be here in Kingsbury Hall to celebrate with you on the very stage where I received my diploma from the late, great Dean Teitelbaum 27 years ago this month. For those of you who are not good at math, and I suspect there's many of us in the room that that's true about, the year was 1996. In many ways, the world was different, but in many ways, it was the same. As it is now, Russia was engaged in a drawn-out conflict, but in 1996, it was fighting with Chechnya. Today, it's fighting Ukraine. In 1996, the federal government was shut down in Washington after fighting over whether to raise the debt ceiling. We are deep in the midst of such a battle today and are at risk of another shutdown. When I graduated from law school 27 years ago, the debate over climate change was in full swing, much like it is today. But in 1996, only a quarter of Americans were worried a great deal about climate change. Today, a majority of Americans worry that it poses a major threat to the country's well-being. And in my convocation, 10th Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Michael Murphy spoke about judicial independence and the risks to it. 
he warned that the judiciary and its independence were under attack. In 1996, the proposed impeachment of a federal district judge in New York was the subject of a presidential campaign. Today, at least half of all U.S. states have proposed bills enabling legislation to override court decisions or to change procedural rules, taking away or limiting independence and authority. Despite all these similarities, however, there are many ways in which our worlds are different. Perhaps most significantly, the internet. In 1996, only 45 million people worldwide were regularly accessing the internet. 20 million of those were in the United States. For the record, I was not one of them. <laughs> but for those who were tech savvy, they spent on average approximately 30 minutes a month on the internet, with the most popular site being AOL.com. <laughs> Today, in contrast, more than 5 billion people actively use the internet, and each one of those billions is spending an average of seven hours a day online. And let's be honest, a few of you are probably online right now, but don't <laughs> worry, <laughs> no judgment from me. The increase in use represents a difference of nearly 42,000%. You and I are both wondering what I did with all my extra time in 1996. Another big difference between today and 1996, you managed to make your way through law school during a pandemic. In 1996, we read about mad cow's disease, but obviously they don't compare. What you accomplished while having to navigate masks, online instruction, increased isolation, and worldwide uncertainty is truly extraordinary. You deserve so much credit for what you've accomplished during a historical and uniquely challenging time. It would have been easy to be overwhelmed by the events in the world in 1996. It's even easier to be overwhelmed today. But having armed yourself with a phenomenal legal education, one that has taught you how to think, how to reason, how to question, and how to advocate, no one is better equipped to face the world's challenges than you. Now, you may not be able to solve all the world's problems, although I won't discourage you from trying. But you can combat the despair and discouragement that can settle in after reading the news or scrolling through Twitter by finding ways to make a difference. Whether in the life of one person or in your greater community, I want you to take the education you've received and to take the degree you've earned and to be a difference maker. There are many ways we can each make a difference. Here are just a few and why they're important. First, be kind. I'd like to tell you about someone who means a great deal to me and was a perfect example of kindness in our profession. His name is David K. Winder. When I had the honor of clerking for him my first year out of law school, he was the chief judge of the federal district court here in Utah. Judge Winder passed away in 2009 and left this world far too soon. He was hardworking. He often got to the office before 5 a.m. every morning. And he was so smart and had a great command of the law. But even more importantly, he was kind. He treated everyone with the utmost respect and behind the scenes displayed a genuine compassion for the difficulties people face. I recall one time we were watching a lawyer in a sentencing hearing, and his performance was underwhelming. When we went back to chambers with Judge Winder, we as young clerks were quick to criticize the lawyer and point out his, or pick apart his presentation. But Judge, Judge Winder did not join in our critique. Instead, he gently explained that this lawyer had faced some difficult challenges in his life, worked hard, and made valuable contributions. It was clear that Judge Winder saw past the rough edges and saw this lawyer's worth. It was an important lesson for me. Fault finding is far too common in our society, and our legal, our legal profession is certainly not immune. It's so easy to unfairly criticize others, other lawyers, other judges, other colleagues, especially when we disagree. But rather than attack and belittle, we can choose to give those around us the benefit of the doubt, and when possible, lift them up. And Frank said, how lovely to think that no one need wait a moment. We can start now, start slowly changing the world. How lovely that everyone, great and small, can make their contribution toward introducing justice straight away. 
You can always, always give something, even if it's just kindness. Relatedly, the Utah Supreme Court adopted the Utah Standards of Professionalism and Civility 20 years ago. These standards include the requirement that lawyers advance the interest of their clients without reflecting any ill will that their clients may have for their adversaries. Instead, our rules instruct the lawyers must treat other counsel, parties, judges, witnesses, and other participants in all proceedings in a courtroom in a, in a courteous and a dignified manner. The standards also demand that lawyers advise their clients that civility, courtesy, and fair dealing are expected. It explains that those qualities are tools of effective advocacy and are not signs of weakness. As one who waged wars and the battlefield of high-stakes litigation for nearly 20 years, I can attest to how civility and kindness make the the work much more enjoyable, but also pay dividends in the long term. I sit on the Utah Supreme Court with Justice John Pierce. He's an exceptional jurist and an all-around wonderful human being. When Justice Pierce and I were young associates in the early 2000s, we represented opposite sides of a hotly contested dispute between the Salt Lake Tribune and the Deseret News. The case was demanding and it moved quickly, which meant that all the lawyers were working long hours at a breakneck pace. The stress and the pressure could easily have created a situation where we, were, we became unfriendly toward each other. We were both fighting hard for our respective positions, and it would have been easy to deny requests for accommodation, infuse our correspondence with animosity, and treat each other as the enemy. But instead, we gave accommodation where we could, We worked out differences over the phone, and we developed a mutual respect, all without sacrificing any advantage in the litigation. That civility made a difficult case enjoyable, and it laid a strong foundation for a future neither one of us could have anticipated as colleagues on the Supreme Court. As new lawyers, you can shape the future of the legal profession. You can choose today to be civil, to be kind, with all of those you encounter, including those you oppose. You can make a difference in individual lives and in our legal community by choosing to act with respect and courtesy, even when there's conflict. And I promise you that if you make that choice, you will make friends, find greater satisfaction in your practice, and you may even find you are rewarded in the future by treating others right today. A second way to be a difference maker is to commit yourself to dedicating a portion of your time and talent to those who cannot afford your services. A recent survey conducted in our third district court here in Salt Lake City reported that 93% of parties in civil cases had no legal representation, 93%. And a national study showed that 86% of households facing a civil legal challenge received no or inadequate legal assistance. One way we, as lawyers, can help remedy this shortfall is to do pro bono. Utah's rules of professional conduct state that lawyers have a responsibility to provide legal services to those who are unable to pay, and that each lawyer should aspire to 50 pro bono hours a year. Many of you are already committed to this this important work. The Law School's Pro Bono Initiative is an amazing program that provides a valuable service for those in need but cannot afford legal services. As you begin your practice, I encourage you to take a moment to identify how you will share the knowledge you've gained, how you will spend your 50 or more annual hours to serve those who would otherwise be left to handle their legal problems on their own. United States Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, certainly life as a lawyer is a bit more complicated today than it was a century ago. The ever-increasing pressures of the legal marketplace the need to bill hours, to market to clients, and to attend to the bottom line have made fulfilling the responsibilities of community service quite difficult. But public service marks the difference between a business and a profession. While a business can afford to focus solely on profits, a profession cannot. It must devote itself first to the community it is responsible to serve. She concludes, I can imagine no greater duty than fulfilling this obligation and I can imagine no greater pleasure. It is this last line on which I want to focus. I regularly speak to young students, and someone in the group invariably asks me what the best case was that I ever worked on. 
Although I was fortunate in my career to work on some interesting high-profile cases, the best cases were my pro bono cases. And the case that gave me the greatest pleasure in my career was a pro bono case I took at the request of an S.J. Quinney Law professor. I was an associate of my law firm, and the professor called me out of the blue to ask me to represent a family of four from Colombia seeking asylum here in the United States. The family had already received an adverse credibility determination from the immigration law judge, and I knew, that, and I knew we faced an uphill battle seeking a reversal on appeal in the Ninth Circuit. I hesitated to take the case. After all, I'd never handled an asylum case, I knew nothing of immigration law, and I had never handled an appeal all by myself. But with some persuasion, I ultimately agreed to take it on, and I had the great fortune of getting to know a wonderful young family who, without free legal assistance, would not have been able to seek the review of their case to which they were entitled. To be sure, the case took considerable time, studying the record, learning a new area of the law, and ultimately preparing the necessary appellate briefing demanded considerable amounts of my time, and I was facing onerous billing requirements but it was the most fulfilling work I've ever done. We ultimately won a reversal of the immigration law judge's decision and secured asylum for the family. For me, it was legal work, but for this family, it was life-changing. And for the past two decades, this family has thanked me by making me one of their own. I've been invited to family celebrations, and I've got to watch two children grow up, marry, graduate from college, and start families of their own. To be a difference maker in someone's life, to know that you used your law degree and experience to do something they couldn't do for themselves, there is no greater reward. Don't deprive yourself of these kind of experiences. I promise you that when the opportunity arises, you will discover that you are more capable than you think you are. If you remain open to it, you will find many ways, big and small, to make a difference. My last suggestion for being a difference maker is to be part of the solution to the challenges facing our community, our nation, and our world. I've been reading the memoir of John Lewis, one of the leaders of the 1960s civil rights movement and a former congressman. I'd like to share with you a story that he tells in his book about an experience he had as a young boy. Although it's not my story, it's inspired me to engage in public service and to strive to be part of the solution in addressing the many challenges that face our communities today. Congressman Lewis tells about a Saturday afternoon in Pike County, Alabama, where a storm had started to move in. He said his aunt herded a four-year-old John and his 14 cousins into a small wood frame house as the sky blackened and the wind intensified. He reported that as the wind started howling and the house started to shake, everyone was scared, even his aunt. He describes the harrowing events like this. The house was beginning to sway. The wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend. And then a corner of the room started lifting up. This storm was actually pulling the house toward the sky with us inside. He said that his aunt told the children to clasp hands and she instructed them to walk as a group to the corner of the room that was lifting. And as that corner of the room would eventually settle, he said they would walk in the other direction, at another end of the house that would lift. And so it went, he said, back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding the trembling house down with the weight of their small bodies. Congressman Lewis shared that over the years, it had struck him more than once that our society is not unlike the children in that house rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us screaming at times as if they might fly apart. He said it seemed that way in the 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement, when America itself felt as though it might burst at the seams. So much tension, so many storms. But he said, the people of conscience never left the house. They never ran away, they stayed. They came together and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving toward the corner of the house that was the weakest. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would settle and the house would stand still. But he said we knew another storm would come and we would have to do it all over again. And we did, and we still do, all of us, you and I. I love this story 
It paints a powerful picture for all of us of how we can join hands with each other and keep the corners of the house down when the storms come. <clears throat> Our world faced uncertainty and turmoil 27 years ago when I walked this stage and received my diploma. <clears throat> I believe our world faces even more uncertainty and turmoil today. But you have earned and armed yourself with a powerful education that if you're willing to stand with the others in the storms that will come, it can be used to help find solutions to life's challenges. We need lawyers who are committed to making a positive impact in this world. Individuals need you, our communities need you, our nation needs you. In closing, enjoy this moment. Enjoy today. Take pride in what you've accomplished. You have worked incredibly hard to be here, and you deserve to celebrate what you've done. I have no doubt that you will take the legal education you've received from this wonderful institution and find many ways to be difference makers. I can't wait to see the differences you make in this world. Congratulations. And now for the conferring of the degrees. Will the candidates please stand? By the authority vested in me by the people of Utah, acting through their representatives in the legislature and on the State Board of Regents, and on the recommendation of the faculty at the university and the, Utah, the university's board of trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Legal Studies, and the degree of Juris Doctor, which entitles you to all the rights, privileges, and honors thereto appertaining. Please be seated. We will now confer the individual degrees. Degree candidates, please come forward towards the podium as directed. And for you, family and friends, if you would like, over here is a nice place to take pictures. You're more than welcome to come down and take a picture during this presentation of the degrees. Thank you. Eric Alberto Batres. <laughs> Haley Rose Allen. <laughs> Connie Stevens. Taylor Elizabeth Hughes. Jennifer Hash. Dustin Taylor Croton. Jennifer K. McGrath. Emily Dawn Anderson. Lindsay Toon. Kelly Anderson. Ricky Ann Richards.
Francesca Emily Lopez. Chelsea Marie Duke. Drake Theodore Males. Sajan Blair. Daniel Schaefer. Brooke DeWise. Anna McIntyre Ballard. For those earning the degree of Juris Doctor, Michelle Brooke James. Amy Gardner Young. Brooke Porter Coles. Debbie Christine Vargas. Adriana Lopez. Alyssa Campbell. Emily Clot. Victoria Tomoko Carrington. <laughs> Esther L. Johnson. Amanda Sue Willett. Shauna Ruth Smith. Alexa Grace Horn. Julia Ivory and Judge Ivory.
Abigail Mauer Rampton. Jordan Michael Conrad. Stephen Joseph James. Michelle Potter. Callan Roberta Ayton. Lauren Eileen Hawks. Jeffrey Garrett Huntington. Miles Anderson. Kyle Juba. Maxwell Sidney Milovets. Dylan Douglas Raymond. Charles F. Rasmussen Goodwin. Anna Marie Pasman. Karina Elizabeth Wells. Charles Joseph Campbell. Eric Lawrence Mullins. Elena Simonelli. Emily Hill McKay.
Jessica Lee Arthurs. Abigail Gabriela Phillips. Nanette Pollock. Jensen A. Lilquist. Paris Catherine Wagner. Mary Grace Thurman. Shelby Lee Stender. Stephen Florence. Megan Charlene Glassman. Zara Alexandra Gennard. Aubrey Jonelle Alstrom. Eileen Stratton Bradley. <laughs> Hannah Cotter Sakala. Krista Morgan Tingy. <laughs> Hannah Pickett. Nicole Johnston. <laughs> Isaiah Letty Odenkrantz.
Nicole Caitlin Crabtree. Regnal Weston Garf the Fourth. <laughs> Madeline Nancy Rooker. Samantha Meeker. Vincent Alexander Mancini. Jacob Frederick Bandus. Joseph O'Connor Marshall. Ashton Gregory Ruff. <laughs> Abigail Grace Gates. Devin Geyer. AJ Summers. Kyle Glenn Fryant. Nicholas Hans Simmons. Jordan A. Kobabe. Spencer Carl Wright. Luke Thomas Green. <laughs> Jessica Reed. Taylor Goldstein. Richard Everett Boomgarden.
Adrian Jose Perez Tamayo. Josh Michael Adams. Kimberly Coveen. Spencer John Fenimore. Dallin Wayne Denton. Colt David Williams. Joseph D. Christensen. Jaden Marie Aploni. Rachel Heathcote. And that's it, folks. Congrats, class of 2023. Now everyone, I ask that you rise and you give it your all in recognizing this outstanding class of 2023 of the SJ Quinney College of Law. all for joining us today in this celebration of the many accomplishments and new beginnings. Before we close, graduates, I would like to provide you a chance to recognize one more very special group of folks with us today. Graduates, I ask you to rise and turn to the audience. With your applause and cheers, would you please let your wives, your husbands, your spouses, your partners, your children, your parents, your grandparents, family members, and friends know just how much you appreciate them. And that concludes this convocation ceremony. I now ask that everyone rise and for one last time, Congratulate the class of 2023.